My name is Coleman Hughes. I'm a writer and host of the Conversations with Coleman podcast. In today's world, we can't escape discussions about race. It's an obsession that's taken center stage in our culture. But I can't help but wonder, why? Why is our society so fixated on this topic? In my new book, The End of Race Politics, I argue for a return to the ideals that inspired the American Civil Rights Movement. I reveal how our departure from the colorblind ideal has led to a new era marked by fear, paranoia, and resentment. By fixating on race, we lose sight of what it means to be truly anti-racist. I believe that a colorblind society is possible, and in the end of race politics, I provide the intellectual tools to make it happen. Join me on this journey to rethink the conversation. The end of race politics is available for pre-sale now. Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Coleman. My guest today is Philip Goff. Philip is a philosophy professor at Durham University. He's the author of Galileo's Error and Why the Purpose of the Universe. Philip believes that science gives us objective reasons to believe that there's value in the universe. And he comes at this from a very different angle than, say, Sam Harris, who reaches the same conclusion for different reasons in his book, The Moral Landscape. Philip relies heavily on the so-called fine-tuning argument, so we talk a lot about that in this podcast. We also talk about whether religion makes people happier. We talk about Philip's theory of pan-agentialism and much more. So without further ado, Philip Goff. Dr. Philip Goff, thank you so much for coming on my podcast again. Thanks a lot, Coleman. I'm really looking forward to chatting again. It's good to be back. Yeah. So last time we had you on discussing consciousness in general and panpsychism in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, now you have a, a interesting and provocative new book called Why. And um, I want to really explore your argument here, but uh, I guess let's just step back a little bit and give my audience uh, a flavor of what what interests you as a philosopher, uh, as a philosopher of consciousness. Why are you interested in this question of, um, you know, whether science can objectively tell us that there is meaning in life? Why not mm. just leave this to religion and to uh, what? Why not just say science is about facts and meaning is about, you know, religion and community and and other things. That's a really good question, actually. And actually, I don't think I, I would disagree with what you've just said. Um, most of this book is just a cold-blooded philosophical scientific argument that there is good reason to take seriously some kind of goal-directedness at the fundamental level of reality. And, you know, like, one of my colleagues, David Faraci, says to me, yeah, you've got a pretty good case there, but I don't care. It doesn't affect my life, you know, I've made my own meaning, who cares? So so most of the book, you know, you could, you could just accept or reject the scientific philosophical case I'm making and it not have any impact on your life. But I suppose when we are talking about some kind of purpose or goal-directedness in the cosmos, at large, it is interesting at least to think about how that might impact uh, the meaning and purpose of our own lives. So in the first and last chapters, I kind of focus on that. Mm. Okay, so at the beginning of the book, you talk about nihilism and, and subjectivism with respect to value. Mm. And you talk about how this is very popular, especially with teenagers and, and younger people. And in fact, you, you told a, a a hilarious story about your flirtations with with nihilism and your more literal flirtations with your your friend's girlfriend so right. can you tell that story a little bit <laughs> oh no i was hoping you wouldn't pick on that uh <laughs> yeah well i you know i i was a i was a nihilist that there's no such thing as value there's no such thing as morality and i guess i i, I live out my philosophy you know it's not just sort of abstract intellectual questions it's thinking how does this impact your life so when I was about 15 I happened to 
kiss my best friend John's girlfriend and and I was trying to say, look, there's there's no morality. You can't be angry at me. I haven't done anything wrong. And and um, well, he had a, a novel response actually. Him, a couple of friends, uh, tied me up, threw me in the back of a van, mm. and took me to his uh, his parents' house and ble- force bleached my hair mm. bright white. So um, so yeah. So I guess there are ways, whether or not there's objective morality, there's, there's ways of making people not do shitty things. <laughs> And did you say to them, well, I, I was going to complain about this, but there's really no <laughs> exactly, right or wrong. Exactly. What could I do? Just start to uh, grin and wait for it to grow out. <laughs> Whenever I meet someone that believes there's no such thing as objective truth, uh, which would be, I don't know if you would call that nihilism with respect to truth claims or, or um, I'm not sure exactly what one would call that subjectivism with respect to truth claims. Mm. Uh, I always just to test out whether they are just abstractly having a point of view or whether they really mean it. I I like to say, well, that's good because I actually saw your girlfriend going on a date with this other guy. (laughs) And and I was going to tell you, I actually took a picture of it, but because there's no such thing as objective truth, I I guess you don't care anyway, right? There's no fact of the matter about whether she's cheating on you. So, and usually it's, (laughs) <laughs> like, wait, wait, hold on a second. Oh, no, no, there are some right, facts. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. So I don't think I was ever sort of not believing in any kind of objective truth. Um, I think maybe that position starts to get maybe self-defeating because do you think it's an objective truth that there's no objective truth? And right. It sort of starts to get paradoxical. But rather the, the kind of more limited position that there's no moral truth or no truths about value, no truths about good, bad, right, or wrong. And that's more of a coherent position. But I think a lot of people, I mean, what I slowly came to realize is how pervasive value claims are. You know, if you're just thinking about murder's wrong, maybe we can just think that's projection of our emotions or something we feel bad about it. But what about, for example, you should believe the evidence. You should you should follow the evidence where it leads. You shouldn't believe contradictions. That's an alt claim. Um, or you know, if you're in pain, you should take a painkiller or something. So actually, what I realised is just value claims are so pervasive. And well, an- another anecdote I describe in the book is you used to do a lot of philosophy in the pub, still do. But one of the professors, so I was captured by David Hume. David Hume's kind of moral subjectivism that all value is rooted in our individual desires. Hume said, reason is and ought only to be the slave of the passions. You have your basic desires and then reason tells you how to best fit your desires. So that was my view. I thought, yeah, uh, by this time I had maybe slightly more civilized desires, <laughs> but uh, but my philosophy press explained to me, actually, Hume's view seems to be incoherent, self-contradictory, because Hume also says, and this is this is why he he gives up on objective value. He says famously, I don't know if you, you might have heard this, you can't derive an ought from an is, right? You can't go from cold-blooded empirical facts about the world to facts about good, bad, what you ought to do, what you ought not to do. That, that, that's the core of his skepticism about value. But then notice what I said a moment ago, Hume also says, reason is an ought only to be the slave of the passions. He thinks reason ought to track what you desire as an individual. So that's another ought claim. And I just, it just, it was one of the most mind blowing philosophical experiences. Because I mean, I, I realized actually to properly embrace nihilism, that there are no truths about value. You really have to think there is no reason to think or do anything at all. Everything is as pointless as counting blades of grass. And I think that really, I tried to live that out for a while, but ultimately I don't think that is a sustainable position. No, I don't think it is. I I, I totally agree. I mean, I, I just, 
I can't ima imagine actually living my life thinking that that every activity is as pointless as as anything else. Yeah. Um, well, my my friend uh, Bart Stroemer, who's a Dutch philosopher, who's a value nihilist, mm. and he's one of the most thought out, uh, co coherent um, adopt adopters of this position. So he realizes actually what Bart says is. Um, to be consistent, he doesn't think he can believe his own view. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> because he thinks to believe something, at least when you've reflected on it, you have to take yourself to have a reason to believe it. Right. But if you're a value nihilist, you don't believe in reasons. Reasons right. are about what you ought to do, what counts in favor of action or belief. So what he ultimately says is the arguments point in that direction. <laughs> so, so he that, takes himself out of it. Like not, I ought to believe this, but arguments yeah, abstractly pointing. Yeah, as soon as he says, "I ought to believe yeah. it," he's contradicting himself. So, um, you know, I I, I remember, uh, you know, Sam Harris and Daniel Dennett have both. Uh, many people have critiqued David Hume's "is ought" distinction, uh, but they have, and their critiques come to my mind. Uh, one of Sam Harris's critiques of this was that uh, it's 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 not that you can't get to an ought from an is, you can't even get to an is without presupposing many oughts. Mm. In other words, um, to get to a fact at all, you have to presuppose that I should care about things like logical consistency, like A equals A. And if A equals B, and just all these basic laws of logic. Yeah. And how do you how do you persuade someone who doesn't agree with basic laws of logic to uh, to, to agree with them? Well, you just say you just you just ought to you just yeah. ought to, right? So there are there are like brute oughts that underlie is claims, and and I thought does that seem at all uh, a sound objection to this idea that you can't get back from is to ought? There is certainly a good challenge here. Actually, it's something one of my colleagues at, at Durham University, Chris Cowie, works on. So he is actually something of a value nihilist, um, at least about moral value. And But then he worries about value claims pertaining to evidence, like, you know, you should believe such and such, you, mm -hmm. um, logic perhaps as well. And he tries to analyze them in terms of probability, like this is the most likely way to get the truth. But it's not easy because it's it's not at all clear that probability <laughs> doesn't also involve reference to value. Um, I mean, I mean, this is what I've come up come up with and it, come face to face with in my book, thinking about the nature of probability in reference to thinking about fine tuning, which we might get onto. Mm -hmm. But I mean, some people have very crude <laughs> ideas of probability, like what is sometimes called frequentism, that we're just thinking of how many instances of this have there been? Mm -hmm. But I think it's broadly agreed that, that those very crude, simplistic ideas of probability are not adequate to how we use probability in science and mathematics. And many people think, and it's, about a, it's quite a plausible position that much of probability amounts to what you ought to believe, how much credence you ought to have in a certain position. So yeah, so it's 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 not at all clear we can get value expunged from these claims. I guess where I maybe disagree with Sam Harris is, I think I do actually, in, in a sense, go along with the is ought distinction. I think if you if you want to believe in value facts, you have to have them there from the start, right? Mm. There are there must be facts about what is good, what is bad, what is worth doing, in something like the way you have facts about mathematics, these mm -hmm. sort of timeless truths. Um, if if there are facts about morality, then there must be something in reality that undergirds those facts, and. Um, something that explains them, something in which they're rooted, something that grounds the objectivity. Uh, whereas I think Sam in his book, he... I'm always excited to talk about a longtime sponsor of this show, Ground News. Navigating today's complex news landscape requires a tool that transcends single source biases. And that's where Ground News comes in. 
Ground News aggregates articles from across the globe and the political spectrum, allowing you to compare how different media outlets cover the same story. From left-wing and right-wing slant to the ownership of the sources, Ground News offers a comprehensive and balanced view, challenging your assumptions daily. Ground News tells you the total number of articles published on the story and gives you the political affiliation of each article. Plus, it allows you to compare headlines for every story. So, for example, today there's a story about how Netanyahu said that the IDF has killed half of Hamas battalion commanders. Now, the more left-leaning Times of Israel has the headline, Netanyahu claims half of Hamas battalion commanders killed, whereas the more right-leaning New York Post just says, Israel takes out half of Hamas battalion commanders. So you can see that the left-wing sources are framing Netanyahu's claim more skeptically, whereas the right-wing sources are more inclined to believe it. This is the kind of tool that makes you an informed consumer of the news. Personally, my favorite feature in Ground News is the blind spot feature, where you can see which stories are being ignored by the left and the right, respectively, which gives you an insight into what each, what each side wants to ignore, in other words, the ideological bias of each side. Ground News is not just an app or a website. It's an essential tool for anyone seeking to engage critically with world events and form a well-rounded perspective. So try Ground News today and experience news in a way that challenges and enlightens you. Right now, Ground News is having its biggest sale of the year. You can get 40% off their Vantage subscription, which is what I use to do my news analysis, if you go to the link ground.news Coleman, or you subscribe to the pro plan for as little as $1 a month. I really appreciate what Ground News is doing, and I hope you check them out. Yeah, what he says is that, so he, he grounds it in the, in the idea that the worst possible misery for everyone for as long as possible is bad. So and he will try to get you to just agree with that as a brute intuition. And then once you have that as a, as a fact, you, you have a conversation, mm. uh, um, a fact-based conversation about how to move away from that um, as conscious creatures. Yeah, so I think that's fine as far as it goes in getting people to agree that there is this undeniable fact about value. But then that's a an epistemological argument, really, an argument about what we know. But that leaves open the question, what makes that true? I mean, I think I talk about this in my in my last book, Galileo's Error. Uh, you know, it's, it's almost like Newton saying, of course there's gravity. Look, there's apples falling from the trees. Of course there's gravity. But that's, that's not enough. We've got to say, what explains gravity? What is going on in reality that makes the gravitational equations uh, true. Similarly, yeah, we can accept there is, you know, terrible suffering is bad, pleasure is good, understanding is good, but what what in reality makes that true? And I, th I think ultimately we have to just think there are, as Plato thought, sort of truths about, about morality. And that gets very mysterious. Like, how do we know about those truths? Uh, how does these timeless truths of value kind of impact our brains. And I don't have a good answer to that, but what I can say is you've got a very similar puzzle with mathematics, right? How, how did timeless truths about mathematics get into our physical yeah, like, temporal brains? Why is logic exactly? Sound? So right. my, this is above my so pay think, grade, but I well, just- Well, I think that doesn't, doesn't uh, don't all arguments have to stop somewhere, right? You have to start with a, a brute, intuition, a brute fact that needs no further justification mm. or else every argument is vulnerable to infinite regress, right? And so you need to backstop it somewhere. And I think, you know, backstopping a, a lot of truth claims with logic is, is, is a fairly good backstop mm -hmm. because no one's going to argue that like A isn't equal to A. It's yeah. almost not no one, but the vast majority of people for practical purposes won't. And Sam Harris backstops moral inquiry with this, you know, worst possible misery for everyone for as long as possible is bad. And to me, that that works as a starting point to get you away from nihilism or, or, or complete value subjectivism. Mm. He, he's he's kind of a pluralist within um, w within that, but but as a backstop to keep you from thinking that mm. actually. You know what? What 
what Ted Bundy, his lifestyle was probably just as good as um, Jesus is <laughs> or the Buddha's, right? But so and just to me, I think that is yeah. enough to get the conversation rolling. Just let me try and push back a little bit one more time. So I agree with you. You have to <coughs> stop somewhere. You know, I, I, I often give Wittgenstein's line, explanations have to stop somewhere. But I think you have to stop with ontology, with some claim about how reality is. I think truth, truth is a matter of our thoughts or our language corresponding to reality. So if you're going to say there are moral truths, you've got to tell me what in reality makes them true. What is going on in reality that makes them true? And how do we get to know about that? So they're the questions I would want to ask Sam Harris. And I, I mm -hmm. don't think he's ever sort of answered though, those particular questions, uh, although there are other interesting. Well, it, it would have to be well. something about like we are in reality and our the way we are constituted is such that there's a huge difference between flourishing and suffering. Mm. And we all know this because we've all um, experienced it. Hopefully, it, like none of us have been tortured. I mean, not none of us. Most of us have not suffered torture, but we've been in pain. We've been sick. Um, and we've also had the opposite. You know, you, you, you have kids, so I'm sure you know what it is to uh, the nameless and beautiful feelings of bringing life into the world mm. and, and all of this. So we all experience this spectrum uh, from, from high to low. And that's a fact about the world. We are a part of the world. And so, uh, yeah, you know, that range of possibilities is, you know, you can make claims about that. Mm. As a as a as, as a part of the world, um, is that not? Do you think that's a, the the route that solves this problem for you, or no? I mean, I certainly agree. With you. I certainly think we do encounter value, and I mean, part of part of what made me reject again David Hume is on, on Hume's view. You know, all motivation bottoms out in desires. You've just got these brute desires, and all of them are on a par. So any possible fundamental life goal is equal to any other. And to, to my mind, you know, what I was thinking about, what about someone who, for example, their fundamental life goal is counting blades of grass and they don't enjoy it, right? They get no pleasure from it. That's just their basic <laughs> motivation. You know, people can be motivated to do things they don't enjoy, like great artists, for example. But this person just wants to count as many blades of grass as possible before they die. They sweat, cheat, toil, don't enjoy it. That is just, that, <laughs> that is just a blood, that is a waste of time. And you compare that to you know, someone pursuing scientific advancement or um, or cure for cancer or just pleasure for themselves, their family, you know, these things are worth doing. Um, or maybe if the, you know, it's maybe a psychologically unrealistic, the counting blades of grass, but a uh, recent former prime minister of ours, I think, mentioning no names, had desired power for its own sake, right? Not for what you can do with it, but just to have power. Again, I think that's 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 a pointless goal. It's pointless having power just for the sake of having power, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, I, so I guess fundamentally it seems evident to me that there is a distinction between things that are worth doing, things that are worth pursuing, pleasure, understanding, creativity, and things, um, things that are just pointless. Mm. But but yeah, but then I do think there are philosophical questions about what in reality undergirds those things, how we know about it, and but I I mean I don't have good answers to those myself. But um, so is it right to say that in a way your jumping off point in this book is that you you don't believe that doing one life path is as good as any other, uh, but you don't quite know necessarily how to justify that from a, a rigorous scientific perspective. And you're looking at, at, at a way to, to do that. Is that right? Or would you put it differently? I mean, in a way, this is perhaps a, 
may be a slightly peripheral concern in the book. So the, the main thrust of the book, I guess, is arguing that we have reason to take seriously that there is some kind of purpose or goal directedness at the fundamental level of reality. Um, and my reasons for thinking that are partly empirical, actually partly scientific to do with uh, this issue of cosmological fine tuning that we find in contemporary physics, partly to do with philosophical issues about consciousness, how we make sense of the fact that consciousness evolved. So, and so I suppose that the, the commitment to value comes as part of that package. If there's, if there's a sort of directedness towards, towards the good or towards value at the fundamental level of reality, then value must in some sense exist. But it's not so much I'm starting from, um, you know, oh, I think some things are worth doing. So the universe must have a purpose. You know, mm -hmm. there's a, it's, um, I would believe in, I mean, I, I, I've believed in value for a long time just because I think the nihilist picture is so in, unsustainable ultimately. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, I think that's slightly peripheral to the, yeah. the main thrust of the book. Yeah. So let's talk about fine tuning. Mm. Um, what does it mean to say that the, the universe is, the cosmos is finely tuned for life? And what do you think the implications of that fact are? So this for, for, is, assume someone has yeah. never heard of this before. Sure, yeah. absolutely. I find so many people that haven't actually, which yeah. is, yeah, most people I talk to are not kind of who are not interested in philosophy or something. I've never heard of this, which is kind of surprising because it's such a startling fact of modern physics. Whatever you yeah. think about it, mm -hmm. it's surprising it's not talked about more on you know popular science shows. I or, agree. So this is, I guess, the. Um, discovery of recent decades that for life to be possible, certain numbers in physics had to fall in a quite narrow range. So I think the, perhaps the example that's most startled physicists revolves around dark energy, which is the force that powers the expansion of the universe. Once you do the calculations, it's clear that if that force had been a little bit stronger, everything would have shot apart so quick that no two particles would have ever met. We would have no stars, planets, any kind of structural complexity. Uh, whereas if that force had been a little bit weaker, it wouldn't have counteracted gravity and everything would have collapsed back on itself in the first split second after the Big Bang. Again, no stars, planets, life. Um, so for life to be even possible, the strength of this force had to be like Goldilocks porridge, just right, not too strong, not too weak. Um, so that's that's the, the the fact that the basic fact, which is fairly uncontroversial, I think. Of course, what we make of that is is another question and gets gets much more controversial. But that's what I would call fine tuning. Yeah, there are many and, such examples, right? That's just one. Right. I think you you talk about the strong nuclear force or the weak nuclear force. The strong you know? nuclear force yeah. is that binds together the elements in the atom. Um, so that can be represented with the number 0 0.007. If it had been 0 0.008 or 0 0.006, now I can't remember the details offhand. Again, yeah. we would have had no, it's not just like we wouldn't have the chemistry worm for the particular life we're made of. We wouldn't have had any kind of structural complexity. So I like think the, it, the whole it universe would be like hydrogen atoms. Just only hydrogen is, is a lot of the possibilities yeah. with different, you know, you know, we can do, we can, play with the numbers, run computer simulations. And a lot of the universes, you just have hydrogen, which is the simplest element, um, you know, one kind of chemical reaction, um, nothing really of, of, of interest. So you really needed the numbers to be just so, um, I mean, it's not like there's only one combination, but if you map out a sort of possibility space um, of different values of the constants, the range in which you get anything interesting <laughs> is incredibly narrow, right? Uh, yeah. So, so I think I think uh, in the book you you gave an analogy for how unlikely it is that a universe would have the perfect Goldilocks uh, Goldilocks numbers in this range, and you said it was something like 
like rolling a rolling a dice and getting the same number like 60 times in a row or something like that and that was kind of the mm. conservative estimate yeah yeah uh, much more improbable that's just because i think often you often get people saying oh well it's just a it's just a fluke you know and i think you you feel you can say that because these numbers are quite abstract you know in not many people have done the physics. I haven't done the physics, to be honest. Um, I'm just taking the word of physicists on this. Um, so you need something to make it more vivid. And, and of course, you know, we're, we're happy we're, all the time. We accept that things are coincidental. I give the example in the book of Jesus in toast. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. you Google it, you get, you know, these burn marks in toast that look uncannily like Jesus or Jesus, as I guess depicted in Western art. But, um, you know, and that's it. we enjoy that because it's a bit improbable, you know, that you get exactly that kind of mark, burn mark in the toast, but it's not that improbable. So we can say it's just a fluke, but- Especially given how many pieces of toast are are um, created every day. Eventually one is exactly. gonna look like Jesus, yeah. one's gonna look like Mahomet. Well, that might connect to yeah. the multiverse option. And, right, but anyway, yeah, yeah, we'll get there. Before we get to that. Um, <coughs> Yeah, so you give the example, but there are things, you know, where clearly you couldn't just say, oh, it's just a fluke. So you give the example of, you know, rolling a dice, get, get, in, get, in, get in six, 70 times in a row, or, you know, if bank robbers break into a bank and there's a 10 digit combination on the, on the, the uh, safe, couldn't think of the word, safe, and they get it right. I mean, nobody would say, oh, well, maybe they just fluked it. You know, right. Maybe they just tried run. <laughs> you know, you'd never say that because it's too wildly improbable. Yeah. And I think so. And, but the kind of probabilities, one in 10 to the 136, I think is a conservative estimate, just more than ast astronomically improbable. So the idea that it's just, oh, it's just chance, I don't think is, is a rationally sustainable option. Sometimes you get people... On Twitter or something, feel like, oh no, I'm brave. I'm going to face. It. I don't mind that improbability, but it, you know, it's not brave to believe improbable things. It's right. irrational. Right. So the alternative is that the the universe was created with the intention of chemical complexity in mind, in the mind of a creator or or some whatever. However, the universe was created. It was created such that chemical complexity was intentionally allowed for some some entity or in some way the dials were being set in a goldilocks range so as to allow for complexity as opposed to only hydrogen is that the alternative that you you endorse well not exactly and if by that you mean something like the traditional god of a supernatural creator um i think you know so many people were so stuck in this dichotomy of either you believe in the God of traditional Western religion or you're a secular atheist. It's like, whose side are you on? Richard Dawkins or the Pope? You know, you've got to decide. And part of them, I, actually, I wouldn't have imagined that I'd be writing this book five years ago. It's been quite a journey, but I've just slowly realized that I think there's inadequacies with both of those worldviews. Both of them have things they can't uh, explain about reality. Um, well, I guess with the traditional God, we have the familiar problem of reconciling traditional God with the terrible gratuitous suffering we find in the world. But in terms of the secular atheist position, I think as it's standardly understood that we're in a sort of meaningless, purposeless universe, I think it struggles with a number of things such as the, the fine tuning. So what's the alternative? Yeah, I think the, I think, look, fundamentally we face a dilemma. Either the numbers in our physics just happen against wildly improbable odds to be right for life. And I think that's just too improbable to take seriously. Or the numbers in our physics, these relevant numbers are as they are because in some sense, they are the right numbers for life. And most people say, oh, you mean the traditional God, but I think there are ways of, and I basically survey a variety of possibilities. There are ways in which we can make sense of that kind of goal directedness towards life, some kind of 
as it were, preference of the of the universe for life without appealing to the traditional God. So in some ways, I guess I'm advocating a kind of middle way between meaningless, purposeless universe on the one hand and the traditional God on the other. And I think there are much neglected options in between. Yeah. Um, so I'm not a physicist, so I, I can't, I follow your logic there. I think it's, I think it's sound, but I, I don't know if it's, um, or rather I think it's valid, but I don't know if it's sound because I can't, I can't really weigh in on whether the universe really is finely tuned. So for example, mm. I know the, the physicist, Sean Carroll, who, um, who I think is quite respected and who I've had on my podcast, he questions the assumption that the universe is in fact finely tuned. Mm -hmm. uh, and he argues that we actually don't have a, a good definition or theory of life. And it's, it's possible that, um, you know, in the absence of, of really those good definitions, it's not correct to say, that we know mm -hmm. in the 90 uh, with all of these different uh tunings of of the un of of the constants of physics that those universes would not have life yeah so i mean i think actually the physics is is not really that controversial you might people might want to look at sean carroll debated um the christian philosopher william lane craig uh, yeah. and part of that was on whether the universe has to have a beginning, which I think it was a bit foolish for Craig to debate a physicist on a cosmological issue. But insofar as they discuss fine tuning, I mean, I think Craig's objections are pretty nuanced, right? He's not saying, oh, this is all a load of nonsense. He's saying, raising these, well, you know, maybe, maybe the science will change. Maybe, um, maybe some of these cases aren't, aren't as solid as others. But for example, the, what I refer to the dark energy um, I don't, I've never actually heard a physicist, including Sean Carroll, um, question that just the, the basic, the basic s physical story I just gave mm -hmm. that if, you know, been a bit strong, a bit weak. Yeah. But, um, in terms of that particular criticism, I would, res I would respond to that because that's more, so I wouldn't like, I would never debate a physicist on physics, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? I've just debated Sean Carroll. A couple of weeks ago, actually, okay, people could yeah. find it on YouTube. Oh yeah. On uh, so did he did he raise this point? N no, we weren't debating fine ah, tuning. Okay. We were debating panpsychism. Got it. So, um, uh, yeah. So on this particular issue, though, I think he's he's maybe it's it's not exactly the physics. You know, so I wouldn't defend like a fringe physics view. Mm -hmm. But on this issue of oh well, we don't have um, a worked out definition of what life is. Um, and Carlo Rovelli says similar things, mm -hmm. but I mean, that's true. I mean, we don't have a worked out definition of anything, but I don't, I mean, take the cosmological constant, sorry, what, what I referred to as dark energy, right? If, if this had been a bit stronger, no two particles would have ever met. If it had been a bit weaker, everything would have collapsed in it. The universe would have collapsed in a split second. I think, I don't know what you think, it's pretty clear there's no life in either in either possibility. I don't think mm -hmm. you need a definition of life to uh, to make that assessment. Or if there was just hydrogen, no kind of uh, you know chemical complexity. So so so, I mean, I think this is uh, uh, perhaps the most common response physicists give. For example, I've heard from um, Roger Penrose, who's a wonderful physicist and thinker. He just says, well, I think, this, I think the science will change. Mm. You know, I think this dark energy thing will. Now, it, of course it could be. And, we should... way, and by that he means we'll, we'll have some theory that explains why dark energy had to be what yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, and it, of course we don't yet have our best theory of the big general, of big things, general relativity married with our best theory of little things, quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. Maybe when they come together, um, We'll find out there's no fine that it, that it couldn't have been any other it, way. It disappears for some Maybe. reason, right? Yeah, or that that the, there's more fundamental laws that don't mm -hmm. involve fine tuning. Mm -hmm. But it could equally be when we get right. to that final theory, there's more fine tuning. Right. All we can d ever do is go with the evidence we currently have, and 
it's almost the definition of a bias to say, well, I'm going to, and I think this is very common with fine tuning. People ramp up the standards of evidence in a way you would never do in other cases, like say, oh, we've got to wait till physics is finished before we evaluate the evidential implications of fine tuning. Or we've got to have a necessary and sufficient conditions for life when we don't have that for any phenomenon. You know, what's, what's, the, what's the definition of anything? Um, so I think, I think it's, I think the basic physics is um, is not too controversial, but I think mm. the controversy comes in, you know, there's some, oh, is this case, is that case? Um, I think the controversy comes in drawing off the evidential implications of it. And there I think, you know, there is just this phenomenon of ramping up the standards a little bit. Right. So um, this, this, I had David Deutsch on this podcast many months ago mm. and he did a great job explaining quantum mechanics and uh, the various interpretations of quantum mechanics, the the uh, two most popular of which are the, the Copenhagen interpretation and the many worlds interpretation. And listeners can go back and brush up on that. But um, in general, the, the many worlds interpretation and other theories of the multiverse um, theories which which predict that we live in a multiverse, um, which are quite well subscribed among top physicists. Would uh, wouldn't the multiverse help explain why uh, why we might live in a fine tuned universe? In other words, it yeah. could be that ninety nine point nine percent of universes in the multiverse are not finely tuned and therefore don't allow for life. And we, of course, happen to live in one of the few that do, which is not surprising because. If you're observing it, then the universe was able to create yeah. something that capable of observing. So yeah, tackle that argument. Yeah, this well, this is what I believe for a long time. I've I've always thought fine tuning needed explaining. Yeah, but I for a long time I thought was the multiverse looks to be the more plausible option. Um, but I, this is why I say this book's been quite a journey. I've just been. Sl persuaded, I kind of dragged kicking and screaming in a way. I've been persuaded by philosophers of probability that there's just some dodgy reasoning going on in this inference from fine tuning to a multiverse, that it involves what's called in the literature, the inverse gambler's fallacy. Yeah. So maybe you can describe mm. the gambler's fallacy and the inverse. So the gambler's fallacy is maybe a little bit more familiar to people, some people when you, I don't know, you've been playing roulette all night and you've had a terrible run of luck, you've won nothing, and you think, well, it's your last chance, it's your last go, and you think, well, I'm bound to win this time. I'm due. I'm due, I'm due some luck, yeah. I've, I've, you know, I've, after all that run of bad luck. Now, everyone agrees that's a fallacy because any individual go at roulette, the odds are the same. Um, it doesn't matter how long you've been playing or, so that's a fallacy. The inverse gambler's fallacy. Um, well, the, the example I like to give, so suppose you and I go to a casino in London tonight and we walk in and the first thing we see is a roulette table with some guy who's just having an extraordinary run of luck. Right? He's just winning again and again and again. And, and then I say, Wow, there must be lots of people playing in the casino tonight. And you say, what, Philip, what are you, t what are you talking about? We've just seen this one guy. What's that got to do with anyone else in the casino? And I said, well, if there's thousands and thousands of people playing in the casino, then it's not so surprising that someone's going to have an incredible run of luck. And that's what we've just observed. Someone's just had an incredible run of luck. Now, e everyone agrees that's a fallacy too, um, because our observational evidence is this particular person's had an incredible run of luck. Um, no matter how many people are or aren't playing in, in, in other rooms in the casino, that has no bearing on how likely it is that this, this person, the only person we've observed is going to play well. Mm -hmm. So that's a fallacy. And I think the, I've been persuaded over a long period of time that the inference to a multiverse from fine tuning that we could go on to, that might not be the only reason you believe in a multiverse, we could mm -hmm. go on to that. But if you're just inferring to it from fine tuning, then that, that it looks like indiscernible 
form of reasoning, you think, um, oh my God, it's really improbable. Our, our, our universe has the right numbers for life. There must be loads of other universes that have terrible numbers. That's exactly the same reasoning, right? Our, our observational evidence is that this universe is fine-tuned. That's what right. we want to explain. No matter how many other universes there are or aren't out there, it doesn't make have any bearing on how likely it is that this universe, the only one we've observed, will be fine-tuned. So I think right. they are. Yeah, I agree right. that that's a, fa that's a fallacy. But I guess the, the tell me if there's if you think there's any validity to this way of thinking. There is a forget fine tuning. There's a background debate where the two leading theories are multiverse and Copenhagen yeah. interpretation, which does not involve a, a multiverse. And now, when you consider fine tuning, one of those theories happens to really make sense of fine-tuning and one leaves it as a further mystery to be explained so in that in the context of the debate between the two leading schools of quantum mechanics does the fine-tuning problem militate in favor of 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 ma the many worlds interpretation or is that like a subtler version of the gam inverse gambler's fallacy yeah that's an interesting way of posing it um so actually well one of the things I'm excited about this book, just before I answer your question. Mm -hmm. So this discussion of the inverse gambler's fallacy charge against the multiverse theorist has been in the philosophy literature for decades. Mm. And A, nobody knows about it outside of academic philosophy. Yeah, I, I Typical example of, of philosophers talking to themselves mm. in these techie journal articles. Um, but secondly, as far as I've seen in the whole literature, no one's connected it to the science. So I'm, I'm glad that you know what I'm doing in this book is is hopefully letting more people know about it and think mm -hmm. about it and debate it. Mm -hmm. But also, I'm also connecting it to the science. Um, so I'm not sure the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics will help, mm. at least as it's normally understood. Because so what that tells us is that anything that has a quantum mechanical possibility prop of, of happening will happen. Uh, so we have these kind of branching universes, mm -hmm. but all of those branches have the same laws of physics, at least as this is standardly understood, mm. right? It's, it's, it's anything that mm. has a, a quantum mechanical chance of happening in our physics, mm. right? So basically all those branches are going to be fine tuned. Mm. What's more often appealed to is inflationary cosmology. So inflation is the hypothesis that our universe began with a very rapid period of expansion and then slowed down. People, many physicists, not all, think that explains a lot about the universe as we find it. And then many physicists think that when you bring in quantum fluctuations and um, other aspects of physics, the most plausible interpretation of this is what's called eternal inflation, where you have this sort of mega universe that's always inflating, that's always exponentially expanding, and, but then regions of it slow, slow down to form universes in their own right, sometimes called bubble universes. And then the thought is we are one of those universes. So there is tentative scientific evidence, arguably, for that kind of multiverse. What I think though is, well, th there are a couple of ways you could run with that. You you, you could have a version of, of in, the inflationary multiverse. I call it homogenous eternal inflation where all, all the universes are fine-tuned. They all have the same physics, right? And that's obviously not gonna deal with the, the fine-tuning problem. Or now that, that's what not, none of them go for that. What they all go for is what what I call heterogeneous. Is that, the, is that how you pronounce that word? I don't know. <laughs> heterogeneous eternal inflation. That is to say, where each of the universes has different local physics. The numbers are different in each, and so then statistically, mm. one's going to be fine tuned, mm -hmm. right? But there's there's actually no empirical evidence mm. for that. There's no empirical evidence at all, right? There is things in string theory that can make sense of that possibility. But what I try to argue in the book is that the only way of avoiding the inverse gambler's fallacy is to go for 
um, homogenous eternal inflation. So even if you're going for an inflationary multiverse or maybe the many worlds multiverse, the only way to avoid the inverse gambler's fallacy is to think all of the universes are fine tuned. Um, that's the argument I try to make at least. So yeah, maybe there's a multiverse, but I don't think it's gonna help us with fine tuning. So one of the other um, argument, the fine tuning argument has most often been used to my knowledge in debates about God's existence and has been seized upon by the, by the theists. Yeah. Um, who wanna say that God tuned, uh, turned the dials just so. Um, and one of the arguments against that has been just pointing out, you know, everything we'd expect to be different if an omniscient, omnipotent, and all loving God had turned the turned the dials, right? So for example, you you wouldn't expect life to be so rare necessarily. You wouldn't expect it to just happen on earth and then everywhere we look around us to be desolate. Um inhospitable yeah you wouldn't even expect earth to be as inhospitable as yeah. it is i mean louis ck has this great joke i think it's, i think it's louis joke where he's like if we're if we're meant to be on earth why am i so damn uncomfortable all the time like it's <laughs> uh, it's always either too hot or too cold we have to build whole structures to protect us from mm. earth essentially we call it inside but uh but it's like everything is hostile to to our our living and all the comfort has been hard won. And then, you know, it's just like billions of years of nothing and then a little bit of life and then we're gonna get swallowed up by the sun and we're on a collision course with the Andromeda. Like none of it yeah. seems like well planned out. It seems, it very much does seem like life is an exception to the rule and like a, a, a bit of a fluke in an otherwise um, meaningless universe. So, so I guess you're not making the argument for a traditional God's existence mm. here, but people may have some of the same kinds of reactions to what, whatever it is you, you are arguing. So maybe, yeah. maybe clarify that and then, and then kind of talk about how you think, how you think about this problem. Yeah. Like, I think these are, these are powerful arguments and we've just been stuck in this dichotomy for so long and. I mean, that's why I think, just before I answer your question, I, I, that's why I think, I think people are sort of in denial about fine tuning um, because it, because they're worried about that's the only alternative, the traditional God, mm. and because it doesn't fit with the picture of science we've got used to. It's maybe like in the 16th century, we first started getting evidence that we're not in the center of the universe and people struggled with that because it mm -hmm. didn't fit with the picture reality they got used to. Mm -hmm. And nowadays people scoff at our ancestors. They're, oh, those stupid religious people, they couldn't follow the evidence. But I think every generation absorbs a worldview it can't see beyond and you mm. feel silly if you, you know, I feel silly talking about this stuff. I wish I didn't have to. But, um, <laughs> but you know, I think we need to just struggle to sort of dispassionately see where the evidence is pointing. Um, but yeah, the, I, I don't think God is a good alternative either for the, all the reasons you've said. I mean, why would a loving God choose to create us through such a horrific, torturous process like natural selection? You know, why would a loving God create the long-tailed North American shrew, which paralyzes its prey and then slowly eats it alive over, I don't know why I'm laughing, sorry, it's horrific, over days until it dies from its injuries. I mean, that, that makes no sense to me. So, you know, to my mind, if you just, so you just look at the reality as it is from our best science, from our best philosophy, it's the, to my mind, it seems like a mix of accident and design. I mean, not design in a literal sense, but some kind of purposiveness, if that's a word. Uh, some things seem arbitrary and gratuitous, some things like the fine tuning seem not to be so arbitrary. So we need hypotheses that can account for both. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, should I? You know, I would, I would, uh, no, it just occurs to me, you know, I have, one way I've thought of this is, is when I think about the traditional God and traditional religion and people, there's this 
uh, theodicy, right? The problem. Of yes. Evil. Um, I can I can see why God would test humanity with a fitler, uh, a, a figure like Hitler, and a, a, an evil, and, and mm. even something like the Holocaust, right? As an obstacle to overcome and a domain in which to test our virtue or something like that, test our bravery. Mm -hmm. um, what I can't see is why a God would have people survive the camps of the Holocaust, uh, uh, s survive Auschwitz, and then die from overeating once they were saved. <laughs> that I cannot see. Mm. And the fact that the world is filled with such uh, farcical evil yes. and suffering yes. suggests to me that either there is no God or God is is a sick fuck. God is like <laughs> God is like Heath Ledger from yeah. And I would, in a way, I would somewhat respect more the consistency of a of a theist that said, "Yeah, I believe in God, but I, I think he's a sick bastard. Like I think he, I think he's a he's a twisted motherfucker." Yeah, because that yeah. actually explains much more of. And he's very kind sometimes, but he's moody, and when he's in a bad mood, he like likes to. He's like a sociopath. Yeah, yeah. That would make sense of yeah. the world as we see it, right? Yeah, I mean the the Christian philosopher I engage with most in the book is. Uh, Richard Swinburne, who's who's also going to be reviewing it for the Times Literary Supplement, and we're going to be debating it as well. So, um, but yeah, he tries to argue that there are certain things of value in our universe as it is that would be lacking in a in a universe with less suffering. Kind of like similar to the things you're saying, like. If we were just in some sort of Disneyland, you know, where no one got hurt and stuff, there wouldn't be opportunities to show great compassion, uh, to make moral choices about whether you're going to help people in trouble and show great courage. Uh, these things would be lacking. And so my response is, is more, even if that's right, even if that's right that, 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 that there are certain goods here, I, I, I don't think God or a creator would have the right to hurt people, <laughs> to kill people, to bring about those goods. So there's the classic, I'm sure you're familiar with it, argument, challenge to utilitarianism of a very simple form. You know, you imagine a doctor who could uh, kill a healthy patient, harvest their organs and save five ill patients, you know, mm -hmm. give one the heart, one the lungs, whatever. Right. And no one in, would ever know. And no one would ever know. Yeah. yeah, you have to tidy up all the loose ends. Yeah. You know, you'd increase happiness, increase well-being. But the most of us think the doctor would not have the right mm. to take that person's life. Similarly, I I I I think Swinburne's designer wouldn't have the right to infringe the right to health and security of, of people living. Um but yeah, so what so what, what hypotheses can explain both suffering and fine tuning. That's my task of the book, really. And broadly speaking, I consider three options. So one, the most, the most straight, the most simple way is just to tweak the definition of God a bit. So yeah, maybe God's a sick fuck. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe God's amoral. Mm -hmm. Maybe God is has limited abilities. Maybe God's made the best universe she can, you know? And God's like, I know it's gonna be messy. Uh, you know, this is the best I can do. Uh, or maybe the simulation hypothesis. If you were in a computer simulation and our designer is some random software engineer in the next universe up who's trying to test out, you know, what what happens if Trump becomes president or whatever. Um, so, so that's one possibility, but it's actually not obvious to me you need a conscious mind to make sense of cosmic purpose or cosmic goal directedness. The philosopher Thomas Nagel has given a very detailed articulation of the idea of teleological laws of nature, laws of nature with purposes built into them. So maybe there's just a sort of impersonal tendency towards certain goals such as life that that interacts in ways we don't yet fully understand with the laws of physics and it might sound a bit weird but um 
I mean, after all, the, 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 the concept of a law of nature was originally tied up with God. You know, there was God's l- divinely ordained laws, but we've managed to separate the concept of a law of nature from the idea of God. So maybe we can separate cosmic cosmic purpose involving laws of nature from the idea of God too. So that's the second possibility. The third option I consider, which I guess connects with my work previously that we discussed last time, mm. um, cosmopsychism, the, un- the idea that the universe itself is a conscious mind with its own goals. And I try to say that's not as extravagant a hypothesis as you might at first think. So yeah, so basically I survey these range of hypotheses. I think cosmopsychism is probably on balance the uh the the better option but i think all of these should be taken seriously we need to accommodate both data points this episode is sponsored by better help life is tough and it can be very helpful to work through your problems with a therapist i've certainly benefited from therapy in the past but it can be tough to travel back and forth to a therapist given all of our busy life schedules that's why you should try better help better help is entirely online incredibly convenient and built around your schedule. Fill out a quick questionnaire and you'll be paired with a licensed therapist. And here's a perk. If you ever feel the need, you can switch therapists at no extra charge. So you're always in control. Visit betterhelp.com slash Coleman today to get 10% off your first month. Remember that's betterhelp.com slash Coleman. Yeah, so let's go down that rabbit hole a little bit. Um, <laughs> this is... a uh, um, yeah, this is what we talked about last time. I think I really strongly agree with your framing of the problem of consciousness. Uh, and, and I, I remember last time I, uh, you, you've put it very well in, in multiple books and, and on my podcast last time, I'll just paraphrase you, uh, it really stuck with me that science by its very nature is designed, it may posit unobservable entities, um, like other universes even, but it only does so to explain observable yeah. facts, yeah. observable phenomena. Yeah. That's at some level deeply what science is, yeah. right? So when you have a problem like consciousness where we're, we're trying to explain something that is unobservable, right? Yeah. Like I, I, I have no evidence that you are conscious right like for all i know you could be a robot where no one's home Mm -hmm. and i'd have no problem explaining what you're doing in terms of physics uh, the best chemistry the best biology yeah um and there would be nothing left over except i just assume that you're conscious because i know that i'm feeling stuff right now yeah and um you seem to be creature kind of similar to me so i extend the the mm-hmm. the charity to mm-hmm. you that there's someone home yeah there's something it's like which is why if i wanted to just like you know i don't know sting you with a cattle prod right now what for for whatever reason mm-hmm. something would hold me back because i'm like that's gonna hurt him yeah where where it would not hurt a life like robot or whatever mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um but this is a very deep problem and you you write correctly in the book that we are basically at square one in solving this problem science Mm -hmm. as much as it's done great things in other places has not given us almost anything uh with respect to solving the problem of why there's something it's like to be this arrangement of of atoms yeah that's 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 a really good way of putting it i think that I mean, someone who's talking about Dan, Daniel Dennett before we, we went on a, um, who I've interacted with a bit on this, on our new books. He's got a new book out as well. I mean, I think what I like about Dennett he's, is he's wonderfully consistent. Right? Mm-hmm. He thinks the only things we're allowed to believe in are um, what you can demonstrate with experiments, third person scientific observation. Um, that's it. Whereas it seems obvious to me, I, I guess you as well, that, hold on, there's something else we know to be real. Namely, our own feelings and experiences. And that and that's not something you know 
from experiments. It's not a scientific datum in that I can't look inside your head and see your feelings and experiences. But it's real. You know, the, the felt experience of pain is real. And so we need to account for it. Um, but no, as soon as you say that, you're rethinking that what science is. So, so Dennett is consistent on, you know, science is just all, all we need to believe in is what science deals with and science deals with observation, third person ex observation experiments. That's all that's real. And obviously, you know, the problem goes away then because that's all you have to explain, you know, how the, how the brain works, how the bits inside the brain move and so on. That's it. Um, but if, if there is something else we need to explain that's not known about in that way, then we've got to rethink how we're understanding science. The subtitle of my last book was um, Foundations for a New Science of Consciousness. We, we need to rethink how, how we're thinking about these things. As, as I describe in that book, our, the father of modern science, Galileo, designed physical science to sort of ignore consciousness so we could just capture everything else with mathematics. Um, so, so I think I'm consistent, Dennett's consistent, but I think a lot of people are still sort of in this confused middle ground where they mm. think, oh yeah, of course consciousness exists, you know, I feel pain and so on, but they don't appreciate that just saying that commits you to rethink our understanding of science, to rethink that it's not just about explaining what we can know through experiments. There's something more going on here. I go back and forth. Maybe it's, maybe it's, we need to rethink science or maybe we just need to appreciate the value of philosophy as well as science. And these two need to work together. Um, but either way, it's not going to be business as usual. And, you know, as th that's why I think we're not, uh, not really at first base even. Mm. So, um, you formulate a theory in this book called pan agentialism. Agentialism? How do you pronounce it? I don't know because I've made it up, but I would say <laughs> agentialism. I guess I guess I can dictate it, can't I? If I create yeah, we can decide. Pan agentialism. Right? Agentialism. Is the official. You will. And so it was decreed. So it shall be. <laughs> I feel like God now. Yeah. <laughs> well, don't be as much of a psycho as he is, please. No, no, a bit more constrained. Um, so, I mean, the operative word here is agent and agency. You want to say that um, there is, there is in some small way, agency built into the very fabric of the universe. The tiniest particles have, let's say, proto-agency, proto-desires, proto-attractions, proto-values. Value is baked in at the very beginning or at the very smallest levels, uh, this sounds crazy. So mm -hmm. make it sound less crazy. Yeah, so I guess the panagentialist view I'm exploring is, as you say, that not only consciousness, but rational agency go down to the fundamental level that particles exhibit some very crude form of rational agency. Sounds crazy, I guess, because we're thinking of human rational rationality. Obviously, a particle doesn't have the kind of rational agency a human has. It can't deliberate. It can't do probabilistic reasoning. It can't do maths or math, as you guys say. <laughs> um, I'm pretty fluent in American. I always <laughs> translate for Americans, and Americans never translate for me. Anyway. Um, but so the proposal is that rather that the particle has, has some incredibly basic form of rational agency in what sense? In the sense of having very crude forms of desire or conscious inclination and the capacity to or the disposition to rationally respond to those desires in the sense of pursuing the object of desire. So, so if you're a human being and you desire something, you can deliberate, you can think, is it a good idea? Do, do I want to eat the chocolate? Do I want to lash out at this person? But the thought is, you know, particles have absolutely no conceptual understanding of what's going on. 
Uh, they can't deliberate. And so the only rational response that is available to them is just do what you feel like doing. So I think I think that is a rational response. It is rational to do it. all things being equal. It's rational to do what you feel like doing, to do what feels good. But on this hypothesis, we'll have to get to why I'm taking this seriously. <laughs> but uh, but on this hypothesis, um, that is the the only, all physical entities are sort of rationally responding to their experience. But when it comes to them, the simplest kind of entities that don't have deliberation, that don't understand anything, the only res rational response that's available to them is just do what you feel like. And kind of like a child, you know, a child, I'm writing this, raising young children. And you know, if, if a child, if a young infant wants the cookie, I'm translating for Americans again, uh, they're not going to deliberate and think, is this a good idea? They're just going to go and get it, right? Mm -hmm. so the kind of idea is like particles are like kids. Or, um, shall I say why take this seriously? Yeah, that'd be great. This would be a great time to do that. <laughs> yeah, I get, I'm embarrassed about all of this stuff. You know, I'm just, <laughs> I've got it, taken a vow to follow the evidence where it leads. So look, I think, there's a big, really underexplored challenge. So we've talked about fine tuning. The other big issue I deal with, making sense of the evolution of consciousness. And actually the discussion we've just had is perhaps useful for setting this up. So I think it's a, it's a big challenge how to make sense of the fact that consciousness evolved. Why is that? Because natural selection is just interested in behavior, right? Because it's only behavior that matters for survival. Um, and I think with the rapid progress in AI and robotics, it's become apparent that you can have incredibly complex information processing mm. and behavior without any kind of inner life whatsoever. We assume at least. Or yeah, it's at least conceivable that, yeah. you know, these things have a big discussion, I guess. Yeah. So it, it's conceivable that natural selection, instead of making us conscious organisms, could have made survival mechanisms, right? right? Really complicated mechanisms, biological robots, as it were, that can sort of mechanically track features of their environment, initiate behavior that's really conducive to survival without having anything going on in the on the inside, any kind of conscious inner life. It seems so it's like, so this raises the question, why did natural selection give us consciousness? It seems like for any kind of survival conducive behavior, mm -hmm you could just have a non-conscious mechanism that does the same thing. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a really deep challenge. And th the aim of panagentialism is to address this challenge. It sounds like a radical view, but I think this is a, well, a the radical the, challenge. The problem is radical. I think the, the problem is, is radical. radical. Yeah. And again, yeah. this is why- I agree with you. So people this. are happy. This is this fundamental methodological point here. People are happy to accept wild views if there's hard data supporting it, mm -hmm. like quantum mechanics, special relativity, really weird, mm -hmm. but there's hard data. Yeah. But they're not some abstract philosophical argument, you're gonna be suspicious. But I wanna say there is hard data here. It's just the reality of consciousness is hard data. Mm. It's just not the kind of data you get from experiments. It's mm. You just know from being conscious, but it's still as hard as any empirical data point, I would wanna say. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, we need to get to a point where as a society we're taking consciousness seriously, as seriously as hard experimental data. But why does this address the, the problem? Because, so it's a big mystery, what, why did consciousness evolve? As soon, if you accept this panagentialist pan position, just entertain it for the sake of discussion, the problem goes away because now natural selection has a motivation, as it were, I'm sort of personifying natural selection, for giving us conscious understanding of the world around us. Because once you've got creatures with conscious understanding they get, and they're gonna respond to it rationally, that's gonna make them survive well, they're gonna prosper and the usual business of evolution. So I do think consciousness evolved. I'm not like saying so God fiddled with things, but we need something like this story to make sense of that. That's the idea. In this picture, does consciousness have causal, a causal relation to behavior? Yeah, I mean, I'm a panpsychist, so I think, you know, all there is is consciousness really. And as I sometimes put it, matter is what consciousness does. So, you know, mm -hmm. What physics is tracking? Physics just tells us what stuff does for the panpsychist. It's like phys doing physics is like playing chess when you don't know what the pieces are made of. You know, physics just cares about what an electron does, doesn't care about what it is. 
you know, like physics tells us an electron has mass and charge. They're just defined in terms of behavior, attraction, repulsion, resistance to acceleration. This is all about what stuff does. Uh, Panpsychism is an interpretation of physics in a, in a sense. It's telling us what stuff is, what it is that physics is telling us, oh, there's this stuff that does certain things. Panpsychism is telling us what it is. It's consciousness involving stuff. But even if you're a panpsychist, you still need to explain, not, maybe, you, don't, you know, you might, you might think, oh, well, why, everything's conscious, so why do we have to explain why consciousness evolved? Mm. But it's not just consciousness evolving, it's like the particular kind of consciousness we have. We have consciousness that's so uh, well mirrors the world around it. My experience now represents the world around me. I feel pleasure when things are good for me, pain when things are bad for me. As Richard Dawkins would say, it's an example of the appearance of design. So I think we need to give an evolutionary explanation, not just of the fact that we're conscious, maybe a panpsychist thinks everything's conscious, but the particular finely tuned consciousness we have. And it's hard to see how, how we can do that without something like this panagentulist story. This is the hardest part of the book. I've got a, I've got a warning at the start of this chapter, yeah. but this is a bit, it's a bit <sighs> abstract. It is the hardest part of the book, but I think that but I you're really- you used to this stuff. I, I'm, I'm used to it and I'm also in favor of it because I do, I feel people just don't recognize how profoundly hard the problem of consciousness is and that we are, as you say, not even at first base with mm. it. And in that context, you have to take big swings. You have to take big swings because, you know, with problems that are mostly solved, now it makes sense to do a footnote on a footnote on a footnote on what the problem is. But it, when yeah. problems have literally only been stated and are deep mysteries, complete mm. mysteries, like we're not at square one with the one of the most important phenomena uh, that we experience, you have to take big swings because it's a, it's a big problem. Absolutely. This yeah. is one of the, you know, the deepest mysteries of, of, of science and, uh, um, yeah, that's what I should have said to Joe Rogan. When I talked to Joe Rogan, mm. he was like, what the hell are you talking about? Well, I, Chemicals I, in the brain make you conscious. What's the problem? <laughs> I, I talk, I was on Rogan last week and I, oh, right. I tried to explain the, the problem of consciousness. And Did you do any better than me? No, I don't. He, he doesn't seem to, <laughs> to view it as a problem. Actually, also, it was one of the first podcasts I did. I, I think I've yeah. got to maybe a bit better at this sort of stuff <laughs> since then. But he, did, he, didn't, he didn't respond. No, no. I, I, I've met a lot of people that don't... Um, don't really view yeah. it as a, as a problem to be explained mm. as as a well you know. a similar experience with my debate with Sean Carroll that people can see on YouTube if they're interested on my mind chat podcast. Um, yeah, he's what, just, what is, what he's is just, Carroll's view of it? Uh, I guess he just thinks he, 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 it's it's a non problem. Um, I mean, I like I like Sean a lot. He's he's, he's philosophically clued up. He's not one of these yeah, no, I know. philosophy is a load of bullshit. I agree, yeah. But at the end of the day, he just thinks if it's if you're not dealing with what makes a difference to the experiments, what what what's the point? We had a we had a kind of quite feisty debate as well, and people in the audience were gasping. I said he wouldn't get a good grade on my course because he didn't understand the knowledge argument. <laughs> 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 but uh, but it was a all good, all friendly, and what good spirited, and um, yeah, that's up on my mind chat YouTube channel. If which I uh, so I run a YouTube channel with a guy with the polar opposite opinion to me. So he's mm. a sort of Denet Denetti, and he thinks consciousness doesn't exist, at least consciousness beyond third person behavioral stuff. And um, so yeah, we um, try to model constructive disagreement in these polarized times and mm. try and understand where each of us coming from and yeah that's great uh, um sorry quick plug there yeah <laughs> so um does any of this you feel have implications in your day-to-day -day life and how you feel you should live your life how you feel you should spend your time um you know how you feel you should treat people how you feel you should use your resources or is this mainly that you are curious about uh, the reality of the universe and simply want to do your part in solving the problem? 
I mean, fundamentally, it's the latter. Most of the book is that I, I, I'm just really curious about what is reality like at the fundamental level. I'm just thirsty for, we'll never know for sure, but having our best guess at what reality is like. And this is where the evidence seems to me to point. Uh, that's why I'm saying things that sound a bit silly, because that's just honestly where the evidence seems to me to point. But of course, it is interesting to think about the implications for human existence. That's what I kind of explore in the final chapter, thinking about how this connects to spiritual practice and spiritual communities and political activity, political struggle. Um, and so overall, I take a kind of middle, I always go for the middle ways, I always hate the dichotomies. And so one extreme, you've got the Christian philosopher, William Lane Craig, who thinks, you know, if there's no point to the universe, it's all meaningless, all pointless. He even says, you know, we might as well just kill each other or, you know, hurt each other. Um, not, not just religious philosophers, the, the anti-natalist philosopher, mm -hmm. David Benatar, mm also thinks life is not totally pointless, but is so pointless, the moral thing to do is to let humanity pass out of existence. You know, we, sh we shouldn't, That's it's immoral to reproduce. I want to get him on my podcast. <laughs> He's he, just, he just wrote a very good op-ed about the Israel-Hamas. Oh, really? Oh, that I thought was a, a, a very mm -hmm. good take on it. Not exactly sure why it matters if none of us should be alive, but <laughs> I mean, I'm, sure, I'm sure he I has think he's an, an objectivist about morality. So he, he uh -huh. does care about morality. He, oh, thinks, right, right. he thinks the moral thing to do is to let humanity pass out of existence. And right. it's wrong. It's, that's kind of become a religion in its own right, actually. There's this Indian guy who tried to sue his parents for bringing him into existence. But anyway, so that's yeah, one yeah, yeah. extreme, right? It's just all so pointless. Um, the other extreme... Maybe my colleague who I told you about before, you know, there's more f a familiar humanist position. It, cosmic purpose would just be irrelevant. You know, we make our own meaning. Mm. So I think I take a kind of middle way position. I think you can have a perfectly meaningful life without cosmic purpose. I, you know, I, I, I did for most of my life, didn't go take this stuff seriously. If you go for things that are worth doing, you know, kindness, creativity, the pursuit of knowledge. If you engage in worthwhile activities, you can have a meaningful life. But perhaps life is more meaningful <laughs> if there is cosmic purpose. If you can, in some small way, contribute to the purposes of the whole of reality, that's pretty huge, you know? So I think, you know, we wanna make a difference, right? You wanna change stuff, you wanna have an impact. If you can contribute to the purpose of the whole of reality, the whole of existence, that's about as, as big an impact as you can imagine making. So I have come to think, to find this is a, a meaningful, a deeply meaningful way of living, I suppose, to live in hope that what you're doing connects to some greater purpose, even if we don't fully understand what it is. Um, you know, and I'm not, I'm not kind of here to say, you know, this is the only way to live life, but I suppose I'd like to invite people to consider that there's another way of thinking about the meaning of life that isn't traditional religion or secular humanism that, you know, might suit you. So I think there is potentially a, a deeply meaningful way of engaging with mm. cosmic purpose. All right, I'm gonna let you go, but uh, before I do, tell my listeners what your book is called again, where they can get it and uh, where they can find more of, of you online, uh, if you have Twitter, website. It is called Why the Purpose of the Universe on sale 9th of November um, with Oxford University Press. Um, I am on Twitter. I argue too much on Twitter, Philip underscore Goff, Philip with one L. Um, I have a podcast, Mind Chat, on YouTube as well, arguing with someone with a different view to me, to debating with scientists and philosophers of consciousness. I do have a sub stack that I always mean to contribute to more. Maybe I'll get that going. But uh, my website, philip, philip, philipgoffphilosophy.com, lots of sort of articles, videos, academic papers, and so on. I think that's about it. Awesome. Thank you, Philip. Thanks, Colm. I really enjoyed chatting again. All right. Take care. That's it for this episode of Conversations with Coleman, guys. As always, thanks for watching. And feel free to tell me what you think by reviewing the podcast, commenting on social media, or sending me an email. 
To check out my other social media platforms, click the cards you see on screen. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.